The latest technological revolution was about the Internet of Information. Imagine if you heard about Google, Amazon, Alibaba 20 years ago. Where would you be now? Imagine if I told you that today there is another revolution going on. Would you like to know it? Who wants to know it? Please say yes if you want to know it. <laughs> You've probably all heard about Bitcoin, but do you know what it is? It is a decentralized digital currency that enables people to share value um, in a peer-to-peer -peer system in a decentralized way. What does decentralized mean? Decentralized means no central authority, no government regulating at all and deciding about the price or what it's worth or something like that. Well, actually, that technology I'm talking about is called the blockchain. But let's come back to Bitcoin. Bitcoin was actually created in 2009 as a kind of response to the 2008 financial crisis. The aim of Satoshi Nakamoto, who was the one who created that coin, we actually don't know who he is up till today. Some speculate that it's the CIA, some said that it's someone else, we still don't know. But there is something more important. Today, 1.7 billion people are unbanked. And I truly believe that cryptocurrency can make a change. It can make a change of how people interact, of how people live, or how they make business, or it can even enable them to make business and to get access to the financial possibilities that are available today, basically to traditional banking. But think about something else. Women, for example. Today, women have, um, have the opportunity to work, in our countries at least. But do you know that the glass ceiling effect is way more present than what we think? Meaning that glass ceiling actually stands for the fact that women still earn more, uh, earn less, sorry, than men for the same jobs. This is not very normal. In some countries, women are not even allowed to drive a car, to uh, do some business, to uh, open a bank account. And when they are not allowed to open a bank account, they can only do with the consent of a man. Can you imagine, as a woman, to have to ask the permission to do something, to even only open a bank account, to have a credit card, a debit card? All kinds of things that basically for us as women in Belgium is pretty obvious. I mean, you're turning 18, you can do your driving license, you can have a car, you can go to university. That's not something that's open for everyone. But one of the things was that these women were actually had access to the internet. And some of them were actually pretty smart. They said, hey, I cannot have I cannot have a bank account, but I can work. I can use the internet as a way to work. And basically, how did they get paid in Bitcoin? And that was actually the possibility that let them have um, a future. Because some of the women who started their business like that and using Bitcoin, they were then able you know, to buy a new computer, for example, by exchanging their Bitcoin. And that gave them a kind of freedom, a freedom that they never had before, a freedom that they might maybe never have in the future. One other thing is that, for example, imagine we talk about free services on the internet, like it's free to open a Gmail account, it's free to have a Facebook account, it's free to have all kinds of services to make a Google search, for example. But do you really think these things are free? Do you really think that you can just type in whatever you want, make a research like everyone does for anything, basically? And do you think that you're not traced? That in a way you're releasing your privacy for free. But 
How can you explain that companies like Google, Facebook, have billions of revenue? For example, I'm coming back to the Cambridge Analytica um, scandal that happened uh, a few weeks ago, where some Facebook profiles were released and uh, some info got leaked to Cambridge Analytica. But how do you explain that during the Senate hearing that uh, Mark Zuckerberg attended, he made $3 billion more? How is that even possible? By just replying, how do you make revenue? Oh, just by using ads. Seriously, if it was that easy, everyone in this room would have $3 billion on his bank account. And unless I'm mistaken, I don't think that's the case. Um, then there's another thing. Imagine, for example, look into your wallets now. Do you have still a lot of physical money? Or do you have credit cards? I would bet that most of you have some cash, or even none, but you have a credit card or a debit card. But every time you go into a store or you buy something online, okay, it's easy because you just put your card in it or introduce the details that are on your card, but do you think that it's for free? Okay, you pay a fee because, for example, if you pay something online, there is also, well, there is always a fee attached to that. If you pay with MasterCard, for example, you have to pay X percent more. Anyway, there are still transaction fees. But do you think that you're free and it's anonymous? I don't think so. You're being tracked by Google, you're being tracked by your credit card company, by the network providers, by all kinds of people who have your information. Do you really think you're free just because you're free to do transactions? I don't think so. Then another thing which is important nowadays is trust. Look at the person next to you. Do you trust the person next to you? Do you really? <laughs> okay, that's kind of obvious. <laughs> would, you, for example, would you, for example, trust blindly the person next to you? If it's the case, how can you be so sure that what this person tells you is true? How can you be so sure that you can blindly trust someone? I think that's... Well, I'm, I'm talking for myself, but I think that's pretty complicated. Because even when you trust people, people are just humans. And they're not programmed, so they might go rogue from time to time. But one of the things that is possible with blockchain is to enable trust. Because a decentralized way is actually the fact that every transaction that is happening is going into a block, then all the blocks are connected together, validated, and it's written on the blockchain. So basically, everything you do, the trust is blind, meaning that the, the, the middleman is cut out. Then imagine another thing. Imagine, for example, you are working in Europe and you have some family back in Africa. I'm saying Africa, but it can be another part of the world. Imagine you want to send money to the person, to your family in Africa. Okay, you're going to say, I want to send 1,000 euros, for example. Okay, I'm going to use my phone, take the, take the app, send the money. But what if that person needs the money the day itself, like in a few minutes. What if you're sending money to someone in distress? Well, one of the things is that if you do it through the normal way, there's going to be high transaction fees and it's going to take a couple of days. But then you, you, think, you, you think to yourself and you're like, okay, what can I do for this money to go faster? You go to Western Union, you go to Western Union, and then they tell you, oh, to send 1,000 euros, you have to pay 50 euros transaction fee. Okay, that's a lot. So instead of sending 1,000 euro, you're sending 950. Okay, that's an option. You know what? With cryptocurrencies, everything goes faster, meaning that there is a cryptocurrency that is called Ripple. And the technology beha behind that actually enables people to send money faster, almost instantaneously. In four seconds time, they can do up to 50,000 transactions. Imagine that, for example, you're sending money to your family in Africa, and in a couple of seconds, they are getting the money there. 
So basically, you are doing something good. You're enabling someone you love to, to solve a solution, a problem that might sometimes be life-threatening. But now, let's talk about cryptocurrencies a bit more. Do you know that last year, at the same time, there was $28 billion invested in the cryptocurrency ecosystem? How much do you think is invested today? $350 billion. Can you imagine the growth? It's kind of impressive. There was a peak in January this year. It reached $825 billion. So it kind of shows you what the potential is here. Another point is that, um, is that cryptocurrencies can really change lives. Um, for example, there are more than 1,500 cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are actually projects, ICOs, that have been made. What is an ICO? An ICO is actually the how can I say it? Um, updated IPO. IPO is an initial public offering which big companies make when they want to go public. But an ICO is an alternative way of funding, meaning you have an idea, you do an ICO, you have a great team behind you, and you can raise funds more easily. Now, when you think about the fact that companies like um, Amazon, for example, are now investing in cryptocurrencies, they are thinking about creating their own cryptocurrencies and about accepting cryptocurrencies, it means there's something to do that. What I would say for numerous reasons, I cannot tell them all because it's um, pretty long, well, the list, I would have to keep you here till tomorrow morning, I think. But one of the interesting points is that um, I think what you should do is make some research about cryptocurrencies about how you can use it, what can be done, what still needs to be done. And I think there is a great potential for people like you, like students from ULB, which, if we think about it, are the leaders of tomorrow. I think there is still a lot of good to be made. Think about what are the problems today and think about how you can solve tomorrow's problems. Thank you. <laughs>